Are you downsizing? Maybe need more room because of additions to the family or possibly seeking that dream home you've always wanted. Well, Tim Eisner at Royal LePage Atlantic is the guy for you. With a proven track record and multiple awards, Tim goes above and beyond to find out your needs and exactly what you're looking for. So if you're seeking a new home or trying to sell your current one, contact Tim at 902-499-5717 or check him out on Facebook at Tim Eisner. Again, that's 902-499-5717. Trust me, when all is said and done, we'll be saying Tim Eisner strikes again. Hey, what is going on, everyone? Welcome to episode 92 of Outside the Shoot. I'm your host, Randy Frame. Had a little bit of a break there between episodes. Unfortunately, I had a a bad bout with COVID, but uh, pretty much all over now and uh, ready to get back to showcasing our awesome game. This week's OTC Player of the Week comes to us from the Marlboro High School Lady Dukes as Ava Del Sato takes home the weekly honors. Ava went 10 for 12 with four home runs and 13 RBIs, along with firing a no-hitter with 10 Ks in their opening game of the season this past week. Awesome job, Ava. Best of luck the rest of the season. On to this week's guest, and we sat down and chatted with ISC and WBSC Hall of Famer and current head coach of the New Zealand Black Sox, one of the best to ever play the game, Mark Sorensen. I'm not even sure where to begin when talking about Mark's accomplishments in the game. Uh, he's a four-time ISF world champion with the Black Sox as a player, first with, with his first coming at 16 years of age in 1984, and that's just crazy. Uh, Mark would play in 18 ISC world tournaments, where he'd go on to win four world titles and be named to 12 all-world teams along the way, as well as an MVP award. As a coach, Mark would guide the Black Sox to a WBSC title in 2017 in Whitehorse, and will be looking to get back on the podium this November at home in New Zealand. We're going to talk to Mark about getting a start in the game in his hometown of Hutt Valley, his travels over North America to play on the ISC circuit during its heyday, those world title wins with the Black Sox, and much, much more. Hopi and I were absolutely privileged to be able to sit down and chat with Mark. Uh, To hear his stories about playing our game was awesome, and I'm sure everyone that hears this is going to thoroughly enjoy it. With that being said, grab that drink, sit back, relax, because here we go. I've got the world in my palm. Lights, camera, action, it's on. I can't describe what I'm feeling. Ain't never felt this freedom. I've got the world in my palm. Lights, camera, action, it's on. Ain't never felt this freedom. Could you, could you say that anything goes to me? Hey, buddy. Go. Good. How are you? Good. Let's talk over each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you normally do. You don't let me talk. Man, we're, we're, we're back again. Yes, yeah, sir. Finally. A little layoff. Yeah. You had your little COVID scare and oh, your COVID geez, in your house. Man. and Yeah. Yeah. And, I, uh, I, 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 said I, w- I said I wanted to get, get it over with, but man, yeah. <laughs> she, uh, yeah. it took me out. Yeah. It's in bed for five days. And... Well, you're a bit of a pansy, to be honest, because most right. people just get it and they have a cold. Yeah, but no. You were in bed for five days. That's what happens. I mean, That's fine. Yeah. It's because you're old. It, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I like we were talking about this and I I, I, th- I just got my smell and taste back, I think. And Yeah, that's weird. Did, did you? You didn't lose yours? At all? I didn't lose my smell or taste. No, I had a bad headache first night, then basically a head cold and just tired for yeah. almost two weeks. I was tired. It's weird, man. It, it affects but, people differently. Differently, like, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and, like uh, there's a guy at work that, you know, he. He's not vaccinated. He got it and hardly had a thing. And he's like, uh, so you, you know, one of yeah, them. but then you got a guy like Jonah Wright, our yeah. friend who got it. And then he has something, the after effects of that, he had trouble breathing. He wasn't allowed to do anything yeah. for like a couple months or something like Unreal. that. Unreal. Yeah. And that guy's a gym rat. I know. I know. As you know, he has more hair in his back than his head, but he's a gym rat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, 
Anyway, we got the uh, Pan Am qualifiers going on. Uh, yeah, I've been following it a little bit. Uh, there's they're not streaming any of those games, of course. They're yeah. only going to stream the the actual championship games yeah. or the the tournament games. Yeah. But uh, Canada is two zero currently in their exhibition season. Hmm. They beat a club team four one and beat Venezuela last night one nothing on a Derek Mason walk. Oh, in Mace. the sixth inning. Mason. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Man. Yeah. I close close teams. The yeah. Yeah. The, they're, that was definitely a close game. I th- uh, Zach Pierce started the game and then uh, Sean Cleary came in and mopped up. They both had seven strikeouts, I believe. Nice. So they did well. Yeah. yeah. They play Argentina. I think they're playing them right now as yeah. we speak. As we speak this Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. 21st. So, yeah. yeah. Tournament starts on the 24th, I think. Sunday. Sunday? Yeah. They play against Colombia to start the tournament. Right on. Yeah. So best of luck to those guys. And uh, well, you know, best of luck to all the all the teams, I guess. It's gonna be nice to you know watch some ball again on online, like some yeah. top end top end ball from the from the men's side. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, yeah, be interesting to watch. Hopefully, they do well. Absolutely. There's one person I wish that was there, and you do too. Yeah. But anyway, aside from that, it's what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. We uh we got a pretty pretty big guest today. Yeah, not a bad one. <laughs> Man, I'm excited for this. Like yeah. Talking to one, of, legit. We're playing, talking to one of the best to ever play the game. Yeah, Mark Sorensen. Some people will just claim he is the best that ever played the yeah, game. Like yeah, he's he's done it all. I mean, <laughs> played in eighteen ISCs and got an all world twelve times. Yeah, it's pretty good. Should ask him what happened to the other six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Mark, well, what? someone batted five sixty six, and he only batted five sixty five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so, uh, pretty incredible. Yeah, and like I was saying earlier, I mean, I, I listened to his, his podcast with the, you know, the boys down down there, Chopper and Damien, being yeah. in the dugout, and it was a fantastic job. Yeah. He uh, had a lot of great stories, a, a couple I'm definitely going to touch on. Yeah, for, for sure. For him to, to talk about again, because <laughs> they're pretty funny. Yeah. So, uh Anyway, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be an honor to actually talk to Mark and uh, and see what he has to say. Yeah, hundred percent. Looking forward to uh, the weather starting to turn around a little bit now. It's still mm-hmm. cold outside, but it's starting to it's really windy. <laughs> it's starting to dry up a little bit, so hopefully we can get out in the ball field pretty soon. Yeah. And uh, you attended the the skill session last night with the the kids. Yeah, a lot of gr- a lot of kids, man. Yeah, so yeah. we had uh, two groups. Uh, we were missing a couple kids uh, due to work or whatever, but mm. um, we had twenty two kids in the first session and eighteen in the second session. So yeah. it was it was good. Some uh, and lots of help too. Good looking promise there. Yeah, lots of talent for sure. Yeah, yeah. Casey McGuire's young fella. Oh, man. Old Casey. Casey, it's funny. Uh, when I was there, I was watching the groups and stuff and, and, and Brody Frazier was standing next to me and, and I was watching Keegan there yeah. throwing the ball. And I was like, who's like lefty throwing the ball. And, <laughs> and Brody was like, Oh, uh, he was trying to tell me that. And then I saw him like walk, walk, yeah. walk and I was like, it's Casey. that's Casey's son. <laughs> that is Keegan. Too and funny. so, and Brody, he's like, yeah, that's it. McGuire. Yeah. And, and so we had a good laugh over that. But yeah, uh, yeah Keegan shows, he shows a lot of promise. For oh my sure. God. The kid throws the ball freaking hard right now. <laughs> I guess doesn't he know does. where it's going, but he throws it hard. <laughs> yeah. He throws it hard. No, it's good. Yep. I'm excited for the kids. Uh, you know, having that many kids at our camp, it's good for minor ball. Absolutely. This spring. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Anyway, let's uh, let's get to Mark and uh, hear his story and uh, see what he has to say. Okay, All sounds right. good. Yo. All right, here we go, Mark. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Oh no, it's great to be involved. How? It's amazing what technology can do with us being on uh, in different parts of the world. <laughs> it, it took a little bit of time, but um, you, yeah. <laughs> we discussed that before. But uh, <laughs> how's things going down in New Zealand today? Uh, not too bad, not too bad. We're we're uh, we're into our autumn uh, at the moment, so it's uh, typically a pretty settled time of year for us, and and uh, part of the year that I really like: nice, warm days, cool nights. So. I don't know. It's probably uh, sort of seventy-five. Oh, you guys are like us. Yeah, it's, we're Celsius. It's about seventeen, eighteen. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So it's not too bad. Calm, uh, clear skies. So beautiful. Yeah, great time of year. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I love autumn. It's my favorite time of year as well. Like, yeah. So how did the summer go? I mean, are, are you guys? You guys are still under some restrictions down there, are you not? No, we just um, ten days ago we just came out of oh, okay. uh, well, what is red? Do we've gone to orange now? But it's basically opened the doors to a little bit more normality. Mm. Uh, so you know, for for instance, sports venues that 
previously could only have a hundred uh, hundred people involved. Now it's, it's it's pretty much open. This last weekend was the first weekend of unrestricted um, attending of sport. So we um, actually it was two weekends ago. So we we took our daughter and and went to a rugby game. Um, nice. And there was probably uh, fifteen sixteen thousand there, which is great. Which is you know a good start to getting people back in through the turnstiles to help, you know, sports get by. Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. What, what do they usually get for crowds over there? I mean, well, they would, um, they would go into the twenties for mm. typically for this, this game that we went and watched, but I think sort of first step, there was a lot, you know, a lot of people keen to get out there, but like anything, you know, I guess we've been under restrictions for so long that people are still a little bit cautious yeah. um, and, you know, take a little bit of time to get their confidence back with going out to those things. So, yeah, I think that normally mid-20s that would be for a game like that. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a start anyway. And, and it, you know, it was a beautiful day, afternoon game. We might, you know, most of the games are normally evening time. So, you know, afternoon games, so a lot more families there, a lot more kids Um watching the game which is great excellent yeah absolutely now have you have you been out you guys been able to do anything like uh, as far as the black Sox go like in the last little bit or, or on hold no we've we've uh we've had a really tough uh tough summer uh we uh, auckland our biggest region here was shut down pretty much for three months and you know half of my squad or more than half my squad is based up there and they i think the the leading clubs played five games this oh, season Ooh, geez. uh so okay. for all, all summer long yeah they they sort of just came out before christmas then we're going to kick it off after christmas and then they started and then omicron hit and and restrictions went back in again and uh, people caught it and, you know, games were deferred. And mm-hmm. so it, it made it really challenging. And, and I think we're all getting to the stage of a little bit of um, online fatigue. Yeah. You know, so there's there's only a certain amount of uh, Zoom calls and Google Meets that you can do to to keep the level of enthusiasm there. So yeah. um, we've um, we've put in place a camp, uh, a, really, a get-together camp for the middle of next month where it'll be the first time that we've had the squad together uh, as a full group um, for over a year. Wow. Uh, which <laughs> for a program like ours is, is you know, pretty amazing. Oh, yeah, um, for sure. And it would, you know, in fact, uh, by the time we, we have that camp, it will be three years since we last played a game together. Holy jump. As a national team. That's crazy. Yeah, you guys were uh, you guys were planning on uh, something in Australia for April originally, were you not? That's right. This weekend it was. It, it's Anzac weekend, which is uh, a historical holiday right. um, here, and, and we were having an Anzac series with the Australians. Uh, but because of the impact of, of the pandemic, um, it delayed all of the Australian national events, which have only happened in the last couple of weeks. So they didn't feel that they were going to be in a position to host us. Um, so uh, yeah, they pushed it originally. They pushed it back to uh, in a month's time, uh, sort of mid late May, and then they pulled the pin on it. So mm. we're really looking forward to that. You know, to one to to get back on the diamond as a group again, but also um, to 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 get out of the borders. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah. It's like a little little bit of cabin fever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I need to go searching for my passport. It, it, it's been <laughs> idle for the longest period of its uh, existence. Yeah. Now, it has has this affected uh, anything as far as you know? Uh, moving forward with the WBSC World Cup, as far as you know, sponsorship and or anything like that, or is everything you know still full steam ahead on on that on that front? No, I, I'm led to believe it's it's progressing uh, really well and. The step that the government has made with uh, changing restrictions in the last few weeks has been a another box ticked for us, you know. So it means that uh, we were a little bit nervous if there were going to be the level of restrictions in place that we had previously had. So right. we've opened our borders to Australia um, just this past week, and then it'll be to the rest of the world. Um, later in the next couple of weeks, two or three weeks in the next month, I think it is. Uh, so it's sort of progressing really well. They've, they've, uh, I know they've, uh, they're in the process of um, redoing all of the fields, so all of the surfaces. Um, the local council up in uh, North Harbour is um, 
his, re, his resurfacing everything and improving the drainage and mm-hmm. uh, putting in some more facilities and stuff, which they did initially back in 2013, which is the last time it was held here. Right. So it's a really well supported area um, for softball, and and they're they're investing something like half a million bucks on improving facilities and stuff. So wow. from that that angle, it's uh, progressing well. But I, I don't think all uh, I don't think all countries have qualified just yet. Um, oh, I think right, there's yeah. still some qualification, and maybe it might be the Americas one, which is next month. Yes, I thought. I think so. I think so. I know they're they're doing their. I know it's Pan Am qualifiers like yeah, right starting now. this weekend. Uh the twenty fourth. Yeah, yeah, or Canada, that they're doing right now. But uh, yeah, I think you might. I think next next month might be the uh, the World Cup because it was delayed as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right too. Now we'll get back into we'll get back into the the, the Black Sox and what's coming up here a little bit in, in a little bit here. But uh, you know, with with every guest that we have come on. Uh, we got to ask, how, how'd you get your start in the game? Oh, my dad played. Uh, my dad played for the national team. Uh, they weren't the Black Sox then, but um, he, he was a uh, first base um, and played for uh, the New Zealand men's softball team from 1966 through to 76. Um, so I um, I think I was at my first softball tournament from from when I was about two or three weeks old. So, uh, <laughs> you know, because mum and dad were heavily involved locally and, uh, you know, you, you you get dragged around and, and it was, uh, wasn't was long. You know, you have, you've got a glove on your hand and you're throwing a ball and you're, you're in the outfield shagging fly balls and you want to be like them and it, um, it was – I think it was only natural that I, you know, I followed in dad's footsteps. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, obviously, your parents, especially dad, had to be a big influence in your career growing up, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, just the, the, through the sheer amount of time you spend together, you know, and, and whenever there's an opportunity to go to um, go to the, some of those tournaments, when you when you got old enough, you, you're always talking about the game, you're asking questions about the game and why and how and where and you know, and you're wanting to be, or for me, it was I was always wanting to be like those guys, you know, and and play alongside them. Um, you know, and then you get to that stage, and I think I, I played my first game of, you know, like senior ball when, when I was 14. <laughs> so you know, these are guys that that a couple of years before I was a bat boy for uh, that. You know, then I'm I'm playing alongside them. So, uh, and then yeah, it goes from. I guess from one thing to another, you know, and you 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 aspire. For me, it was about aspiring to be better. Um, each time you went out there, no matter what team you played for, and you know, development came along uh, from there. Yeah, yeah. You you played like like you mentioned there, your first senior game. That that was with Hutt Valley Cardinals, correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was my uh, club. Mum and dad were involved with um, all of you know all of dad's playing career, um, and the same for me. All of all of my career played with uh, the same club. So, what was it like? You know. Being fourteen, young, yeah, fourteen, and <laughs> and playing with like grown men like that, yeah. like that's crazy to think about. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's it's so long ago now. Actually, <laughs> but you, um, it was a bit intimidating to start with. But you, you know, it, I I think at the time, you know, I really just approached it that it, it, it was just a game. Mm. You know, I was just going out playing a game that I'd played all of my life and and loved it. It was just the ball was coming a little bit quicker and. You know the guys that uh, that I was playing against were shaving more often than I was. <laughs> yeah. So, like <laughs> for a while, <laughs> for a while, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, like those first couple of years, what were some of the things that I mean that you took with you that you know as you progressed that that you took with you? Was there anything like those first couple of years that you know you were able to take with you? <laughs> Well, it was about um, – I, I learned really uh, quite early on that, you know, if, if I didn't believe in my own ability, then no one else would. Right. So, you know, to, to have that confidence and belief in, in my skills and ability, uh, was it was really aimed at taking the age factor out of it. Mm. You know, don't worry about how old you are, um, but you've got confidence that, you know, as, as a hitter you can go out and hit anybody that – that gets uh, you get put up against, you know, it, it changes the dynamic a little bit because there's that there's that fear factor that you know athletes and young athletes have going out there, and and a lot of it is driven for me 
was driven around, you know, a lack of belief, right? You know, to start with. So uh, when you started believe, or when I started believing that I belonged, you know, and then you started to see uh, an improvement in performance. And and I'd always had, you know, always from from a young age, I'd always had a pretty good work ethic, you know, because I always wanted to. You know, it's like most kids, you want to be out in the park throwing a ball, hitting the ball, and that kind of transferred into my game. Is that you know, I wanted to. When I was hitting, I wanted to. I wanted to take you know, just just another five cuts, just another five cuts. Yeah. Let me take five. You know, um, always wanted to just work on it a little bit better, and, and uh, I guess that striving for perfection. Um, and so, work ethic was never was never a problem because I loved uh, working on my craft. I suppose it was more about that confidence. And you know, as, as you when you're at that age, you you're still developing. Your, your own technique and you're still growing, you mm-hmm. know, you're, you're, still, yeah. you're still a kid really. So, you know, with the physical growth over the, you know, over those next few years, you, it then saw my hitting style sort of change a little bit. Um, you know, my, my swing plane flattened out a little bit more. Um, I, uh, my my contact percentage went up, you know, so my strikeouts went down and it just how evolution sort of took over and then once that started happening, just all of a sudden it was like uh, some pretty good performances started to follow, you know. And then and then I uh, was fortunate enough to make the Black Sox as a sixteen-year-old, so I'd only been playing for a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we're not laughing at you, by the way. It's just amazing. <laughs> like, yeah. Fourteen, I gonna, sixteen. I was going to ask that. I mean, kids are still playing with toys when they're fourteen. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> let's jump into eighty-four. I mean, sixteen years old. I, I was shooting for a, a Bantam B provincials for freak sakes. Like I mean, <laughs> yeah, and, you're still in beer to your old man's fridge. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, you're with the New Zealand Blacks. I mean, first, I guess, what was it like being named to the team at such a young age? And I guess second, what do you recall about that ISFs and you, you guys well, went was, on to be a world champion? Yeah, we did. Um, it was, it was pretty surreal because you sort of started, I started the season uh, well, I started that season as a 15-year-old. I turned 16 uh, <laughs> during that season here. And um, I, I, I remember the year starting out really well in, the, in sort of our pre-season tournament. And, you know, as the year wore on, the um, my performance was fairly consistent at most events. And it, it, the noise, you know, started uh, growing, I suppose, started developing around – the possibility of, of making that team. Now, I, I was predominantly a catcher mm. um, at that age, so, you know, uh, doing most of the catching for our Cardinals side. And um, that was the only area of concern was that, you know, such a, putting someone in such a key position at such a young age where yeah. you know, catchers take – you've got to take time to develop. And um, and I think I did over time, and certainly, you know, you got I got better behind the plate, more from a game management point of view. But from raw, uh, raw skill and talent, I suppose, um, you know, that was the thing that got me to the stage where you know we were in the Cardinals, uh, we had club rooms in those days um, with family and friends, and and the team was named um, over the radio, and yeah, it was it was pretty surreal that. <laughs> You know, you hear your name be called out, and you knew there's a chance, and you're a little bit, a little bit nervous, a little bit anxious. Um, but it was, you know, it was like, geez, if it's not now, there's there's still plenty of time left. <laughs> <Right. Yeah>. I'd <laughs> say. <Yeah. laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, it, would, it did get read out, and it was like, wow. Um, but then, you know, I, I, I went to school the next day. <laughs> <Yeah. school>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so all of a sudden, uh, my, yeah. my status at school improved, you know, the next day. <laughs> yeah. Girls coming up to you and whatnot, what? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so all of a sudden, uh, became a little bit more popular. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, do you find, were you forced to grow up quickly playing in that kind of environment? Yeah, you, you are. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you you know it's it's uh, in any team and or I guess business team or whatever it may be you you know I learned early is that um, with a new kid on the block you keep you, you keep your head down you work hard um, you know you ask questions you listen you learn and you wait your turn you mm-hmm. know so uh, certainly you know just about uh, great skills and values around growing up. Um, in life, and but the you know I, I do remember. So on that trip, we went to uh, we we're in California having a build up tour, and 
the guys the guys were going out to a bar one night, um, <laughs> and it's and yeah, I just got left at the hotel. You, know, <laughs> you, you left here, you yeah. can't come with us, uh, you know, because you can't. A sixteen year old, no matter. How, yeah. how often you're shaving you can't fake a 20 year old ID <laughs> yeah really <laughs> maybe as a 19 year old yeah. you could do but uh, not as a 16 year old yeah so I got the, the boys went out for a night and um, yeah I got left at the hotel watching TV I think <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> I'm trying to picture that. Like, oh, man. Yeah, I know. God. Actually, actually, uh, of course, I listened to your episode with Chopper and Damien on Beyond the Dugout, and it was okay. such a fantastic episode. Uh, but you got to tell us the story about, you know, getting grounded for the, <laughs> yeah. for the awards banquet. <laughs> yeah. For our fans. We've already heard it, but our fans need to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it, 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 it was that year. Um, that I got named in the um, uh, I got named in the Black Sox uh, for that that trip and during that uh, season there uh, in Wellington here where I live, this uh, the region is split into two areas and Hutt Valley, which is where Cardinals is from, and, and I've played in the Hutt Valley as I said my whole life, and then there's there's Wellington and, and post Christmas there's there's a separate league for each area, so. Post Christmas, traditionally, we would play in a, what's called an intercity league, and the top teams, top four from each, would play off, and the bottom four would play off. Mm-hmm. And the players of the day at the time were given a bottle of Karuba rum, which uh, um, you know was was a sponsor of of the event. And I had a couple of uh, player of the day um, awards that I, I, I got at the end after the final. Um, of the intercity, and and then we also got given one uh, for making the black socks. So uh, here's me as a 16 year old with I think I had three or four <laughs> bottles of um, Karuba rum. Well, you know you you, you want to be a man, so um, <laughs> crack the crack the lid off and start drinking away. And um, I think uh, it was about uh, I'd, by about eight o'clock that night, one of them had gone. Um, so in about three hours, uh, we, we'd knocked off a bottle of Karuba and I think the guys realized that um, I wasn't in a real fit state to carry on. So uh, <laughs> they dropped me at home, uh, rang the doorbell and left. Um, and, and I don't remember whether it was mum or dad, but they found me on the front porch, not in a great shape. Um, so took me up to bed and unfortunately um, – had a little reflux later on, and um, it didn't. <laughs> it didn't stay down. Um, so I, I was, yeah, pretty worse for wear. But a consequence of that was that I, I was grounded for um, for our <laughs> our prize giving, which was the next week. So you know, the the club prize giving, and our club had sort of six or eight teams there, and so there's I don't know maybe a hundred odd people um, at the prize giving, and and I was allowed to turn up for our team prize giving and to receive an award for making the national side. And then I had to go home. Uh, So (laughs) yeah, made the national team, but uh, was grounded for the prize giving. Oh, that's, when, when I heard that story, though, I, I laughed so hard. I, I just, I'm just picturing like you're on the New Zealand Black Sox, but you're, you're <laughs> grounded. grounded. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. wow, that's a such a great story. Now, Mark, I got to ask you about uh, how did the opportunity to come play over in Amer- North America take place? Well, it sort of started, I think. Uh, I'm trying to think when the first players went over there, maybe late seventies. Um, the first New Zealanders went over there and they were typically pitchers. Uh, and then they, you know, got a name for themselves. New Zealand got a, a, a pretty good name with providing pitchers and sort of late seventies, eighties, you know, the, um, the Kevin Hulahees and, you know, Paul McGann's and Steve Schultz and, yeah. you know, the name, the list names that could go on. And, I guess from there they then started to look, say, well, okay, if they've got, you know, really good pitching down there, they must have some decent players to be able to hit that pitching. So it sort of went from one stage to another and then uh, some of the guys uh, got got an opportunity as position players to go over. And thankfully um, the first guys that went over made a good fist of it. And so then, you know, the, the clubs came knocking and looking for other players and, you know, then you know we we, we play a sport that's got a pretty small yeah. um, world. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it, it's a bit of a village, really, isn't it? I mean, so you, yeah, you know, hey, we're looking for a good young catcher. 
um, you got anyone down there? And it's like, yeah. So uh, Paul McGann, uh, no, it was Peter Meredith, sorry. Peter Meredith was playing with uh, Madison the Farm and they were looking for a catcher and then, yeah, long story short, they reached out and, you know, I went from uh, I think this time of year uh, play, uh, doing preseason rugby training for my local club to all of a sudden them being on the plane and headed to Madison, Wisconsin as an 18-year-old um <laughs> For six months, for first time away from home. <laughs> That's crazy. Then, like eighteen years old, going to the firm. Like of all yeah, the teams, gosh, yeah. the firm. Like <laughs> yeah. they're world renowned. Like yeah. the firm. What uh, What do you remember about arriving there? I remember that Meredith picked me up uh, with Rod Peterson, and on the first night, and we surprisingly they went drinking, um, <laughs> <laughs> being from the farm, and. Uh, we were downtown in Madison, and and I was yeah you know, I just travelled for you know twenty eight or thirty hours halfway around the world, and you're going your time zones all messed up, um, you know you're tired after travel and downtown. But I, I was certainly starstruck because Madison is, uh, is a pretty cool place, mm. and you know sort of uh, April time, um, sort of April I think it was late April that I went over there. UW Madison is still in, um, so. It's pretty active um, downtown there. Yeah. So it, um, yeah, I, I, I was, I think I was walking around with with uh, with my tongue hanging out, dribbling the whole time, and I just <laughs> in, in, awe, in awe of what I was seeing. Um, and then I turned around, and Meredith was gone. Um, he'd uh, he'd he'd uh, reconnected with an old friend, and uh, he left me. Downtown, so thankfully, <laughs> halfway around the world, not knowing, <laughs> not knowing anyone. Um, <laughs> thankfully, one of his buddies who he introduced me to said, oh, Pete's gone. You better come with me for the night. And I'll hook you back up with him tomorrow. So, yeah, first night away in a different country, um, I'm stranded thinking, <laughs> oh, my gosh, where, where am I going to stay tonight? I've got all my gear. Uh, yeah. Welcome but, to yeah, America. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's it. Thanks a lot, Welcome Pete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's crazy! What but we- I, I really enjoyed that year. You know, it was yeah, kind of a, um, kind of a breakout year, I suppose. You know, you're, you're cutting the shackles and hmm. going overseas and playing with different players and different leagues and different areas and different interpretation. Yeah, you know how the game is played. So, um, I, I, I think overall I did okay that year. It wasn't it wasn't a banner year, but sort of it was more of a breakout than anything else. What was it like playing in that uh, first ISC tournament? Oh, it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool. We I, I remember. Unfortunately, we lost the game. Opening night, we played um, the Tulsa Firebirds, a um, first ISC game, and it was a guy pitching for them called Mike Coombs. And big old farm boy from you know um, Oklahoma, and and he just threw hard down and change, and we we got beaten on a, a, a Meredith pitching, uh, we got beaten on a bloop single, where they scored one run, and that was kind of Meredith's. Uh, I guess his MO with the farm was that he would keep them in games, but they couldn't score a yeah, run. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, you know for so long. Uh, but yeah, opening night it was in Sioux City, ironically, which is where I ended up. You know, spending a great deal of my career and had a lot of success. So, on the main diamond in Sioux City and and playing that. Um, and f- funnily enough, I ended up. I, I think I uh, I was hitting three to to start that event, <laughs> um, which as an you know uh, I suppose as an eighteen year old isn't a isn't a bad start for your first <laughs> ISC. No, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't get a hit though, but uh <laughs> Hey, it's, but no, it's the it experience, was, right? Yeah. Yeah. It 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 was really um what I found about the ISC there, it was really contagious mm. in that, you know, it made me want more because I could see, you know, these teams that are, you know, you get through to Wednesday, Thursday, and the teams are still playing. And I hung around for a couple of days after because uh, I was I was living with um, good Canadian boy Mike Pieknik, oh, Peaches, and Peaches, yeah. Peaches, yeah, yeah. So we uh, we stuck around for a couple of extra days and uh, watched a few more games and and to see those teams that were were, were playing later in the week, mm-hmm. you know, it was like wow, the standard of ball here is really quite cool. Um, you know, oh, I want to be there. 
um, I want to be a part of this. I want to, you know, I want to play on Friday and Saturday and get to a championship game. Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of that that led to that uh, that drive to uh, want to be better. But as I said, you know, it, uh, it was really contagious. I wanted to go back, and and I left there with with a real buzz. You know, you're sort of on cloud nine, go, wow, this is the standard I need to get to. Yeah. Um, you know, and how do we best do it? So, what led to the move to Sioux City? Um, well, uh, dollars, I suppose. Yeah. Um, from uh, you know, it 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 was a great year with the farm, but mm-hmm. it wasn't. They they I wasn't going to get to where I wanted to go by playing there. Right. You know, I, I was playing with um, – and they're wonderful men and had a great year, but I, I was playing with guys that were as old as my dad. Um, yeah. And they were – you know, the, if, if they had a good run, they might get to Tuesday, Wednesday at that time. Right. You know, sort of 10 years later, um, they – you know, they became a force. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at that time, um, that wasn't going to help me get to where I wanted to go. Um, plus my uh, Paul McGann, who I mentioned before, you know, he, he was pitching with Steve Schultz at Sioux City. And both of them played had previously played for our Cardinals team. Uh, in fact, Steve Schultz had, had boarded with my family. Uh, <laughs> so when, when he moved – yeah. yeah, when he moved from a place called – Blenheim in the South Island up to Hutt Valley to play. He, he stayed with us. So um, you got a couple of guys that are like brothers to you that are encouraging you to go and play for this team. They've got aspirations of going all the way. I'd been to Sioux City the year before. You know, I, I, I admired they, they went deep in the tournament. You know, they got their own park. Um, there were a lot of boxes that were ticked mm. uh, and became, you know, in the end became quite an easy decision. But – you know, and that was the start of, um, I guess, the building of, you know, a team that's probably still one of the better teams um, in the history of the game. Oh, absolutely. As I mean, <laughs> you'd have some pretty good years there, I'd say. I mean, you'd be named your first All-World in, in 87, then win your first ISC title following your 88, correct, was when you won your first yeah, one? Yeah, so that's right. What was what was life like for Mark Sorensen around this time? Must have been pretty, pretty, pretty good, right? Well, I came home and uh, proudly announced to my family that because I, I, I was such a, an amazing commodity in the world of softball that I no longer had to do the dishes in the house <laughs> after dinner, that I couldn't uh, soften my hands in the, yeah. in the dish in the water. So my sisters uh, gave me uh, a short retort on that. <laughs> Um, but I, yeah, <laughs> I was trying to elevate my seniority within the household, and 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 that didn't happen uh, that successfully. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but no, life life was pretty life was uh, life was pretty good. I mean that I suppose those you know those first few years at in Sioux City, we were just um, going from post to post. You know, we we were get we were winning. We were getting better each each week. We were improving each year. We had you know great. It was a great little town. There wasn't a great deal going on in Sioux City, but mm. you know it's a great ball town. Um, you, you know we had a great sponsor. You know, good people support it. You had good fan support. It was fun to be involved with. You know, you, you we played. Um, you know, for, we probably played half our our weekends of the year at home. Because everybody wanted to come to Sioux City and play, right? You know, it wasn't it wasn't a city park; it was owned by our sponsor. You know, so oh, yeah. um, you know, Friday night you would regularly have two or three thousand people coming to watch opening night of a of a weekend event. Wow, um, that's awesome. You know, then then you know, you, and and you'd have six or eight teams almost every week uh, mm. coming in to play. So you know, it was it was a fun it was a fun time. Uh, but, you know, also the travel and, and getting around um, to most parts of, of North America during those years and meeting, you know, a whole bunch of awesome people that, uh, you know, to, still to this day, uh, you know, I can I can, um, I can can look on, on them as being really great friends still. Yeah. yeah. Right on. I got to ask about that 91 win in uh, when you guys won in Sioux City. That must have been a pretty cool atmosphere to play in. Yeah. Yeah, it. Um, um, 
I think we, we really – that was the year after um, – uh, Paul McGann and Steve Schultz were unfortunately killed in a car accident. Oh, that's right, too. Yes. And you know they'd yep. they'd been a big uh, they'd been a big part of of the the growth and development of Sioux City over the years. You know that happened in ninety. Mm. Um, so we were really riding, I suppose, on the crest of an emotional roller coaster. There, you know, having lost two mm. of the key figures. You know, Schultz was the first Kiwi on the side. Um, and I think he was there in about 85 or 86. And then Paul, um, I think he went a year later. And then I, or maybe Paul and I, no, Paul and I joined together in 87. Uh, but he had already been recruited. Um, so, you know, that had been a big part of that development. So, you know, you, we, we had a pitching staff of what Michael White and um, Doug Middleton you know, Pete Sandman, Jesus. Um, and I'm pretty sure Jim Jim Wano, Jim Seaman at the time. Oh, that's right. Yeah, was was you know the fourth horse. <laughs> so you know you you had a pretty formidable staff, and and you know in in all positions we um, you know we had we had all world type ball players, yeah. but. You know, and and we always drew well, and we always got great fan support. So the further it went in the week. Um, you know, the 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 more you know the support was there. And I think um in fact we played Undy in the final, didn't we? Um with Owen Sound. That's right, yep, yeah. That's right, in yep. 91. Yep. Yep. Yeah, he 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 had a you know, another one of his Herculean sort of performances and took them all the way through. Um and yeah, you know, and we, we come to the table for the final going, okay, which one of these four guys do we want to throw out there? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a great luxury. Gosh, yeah. Yeah, and poor old Undy had carried the load, yeah. um, you know, offensively and defensively. I think he was always hit. He, uh, yeah, he, he hit three and and threw gas. Yeah, um, Timmy Wall had an outstanding enough, tournament for you guys in that that tournament. Timmy Wall, yeah, he yeah, hit five hundred uh, and was MVP or something. Great, like that. great ball player. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you know, as I said, world class guys all the way around. And and, and that uh, the thing about that is, then you only just. Um, have to worry about your performance. That's right. You know, you, you, you're not worrying about anyone else. You know other people are going to do their job. And and the biggest challenge for Russell Boyce, um, our manager at the time, was, you know, was pulling the personalities together uh, because you, you've got people from, you know, you've got Canadians, you've got Americans, you've got Kiwis, um, you know, athletes all have egos. Yeah. So, you know, molding a group together that, uh, perform to a high level. Just having the best talent doesn't mean you're going to succeed. Mm-hmm. And I think that was one of Russ's uh, phenomenal strengths. Was you know he he was a real man manager, a real people manager, and he managed to pull that group together. Um, and I think you could have put picked an all star team out of every other team there, and this team still would have gone through yeah. and and beaten them. You know that was such the strength. Oh, yeah. um, of the group, and and again connecting to the loss of Steve and Paul the year before, it, you know, it was oh, I think it was always going to happen that 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 mm. that was our sort of catch cry and emotional, you know, trigger all year was you know doing it for those guys, especially with it being at home. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, having having something like that to play for and having the team chemistry. I mean, <laughs> that's that's a hard recipe to beat, right there. Hundred percent. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And the chemistry side of things, I think a lot of teams underestimate. Yeah, oh, I think teams absolutely. now now are starting to realise, you know, uh, well, it's, you know, there's so many, um, there's so many, you know, catch cries and phrases and stuff that you can use for it. But you know, if you if you get a group of athletes that you know, prepared to sacrifice something and and commit to a common cause, uh, you can actually achieve greater things than a talented group of athletes that are just playing for themselves. Yep. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Absolutely. Now, you then you move on to play from for Green Bay after that. Uh, How did you enjoy your time there? Oh, that, that, those four years in Green Bay uh, were probably the the most fun time of of my time in America. Mm. Um, because the guys that I was playing with, we we're all a similar age then. You know, sort of I started off as the young guy playing over there and as you progress with age, you know, you, the age belt, you're no longer the younger guy. So, you know, the um, Colin Abbotts and the Sean Reicheks and 
um, you know, the Connolly brothers and Steve Schott, and, you know, we were John Becker. We were all of a similar age bracket. Yep. Um, so we were kind of growing up together. Um, you know, and on the, on the, on the mound, we, we had, uh, we had Undy the first year I was in Green Bay, uh, which we, in 94, we won the IC in, in PEI, um, with Paul Elgar. Oh, that's and too, yeah. Russell, and, and Russell Cooper. So, you know, we, 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 the all car team was similar to the farm team, I suppose, when I first went over there, sort of had a, uh, had a reputation of being, Guys that got their days and nights mixed up. You, know, <laughs> you, you played always at night and rested during the day. Um, but I think you know the the influx of guys from other areas and you know changing from a uh, even though they're serious a social serious team to a you know mm-hmm. professional serious team. Yeah. Um, and and Russell Boyce again he was in charge there, so um, he he did a, a, an amazing job. Um, again, managing those personalities and putting it together. But Green Bay is such a cool part of um, of America. You know, really, really laid back. Um, I, f- I found it uh, very similar to, to here in New Zealand. I, you know, the people were really welcoming. You know, we had a we had a good bunch of guys that, as I said, were sort of growing up together, and we had a great sponsor, Les Siegel, that you know just loved the game, and. We sort of travelled all over and played, and and yeah, my four years there were, uh, yeah, as I said, some of the most fun times of of my playing career, actually. Awesome. Oh, did you get to any Packer games? Absolutely, oh, I, yeah. and I'm still a Packer fan. Yep. <laughs> oh, uh, Les, our sponsor, um, he had a, a Skybox there, so oh wow, always um, uh, always got uh, normally one or two preseason games, and depending on how late. I stayed. I'd, whenever it started getting too cold there, I'd, I'd be out on a plane and gone. Um, come back, follow the sun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I might get the odd one or two regular season games, but yeah, each year we would certainly get to go to two or three games. And fortunate enough, they said to be in it and Liz's box there. So, you know, but uh, have uh, have been a Packers fan ever since. Wow. So. That's awesome. That's- uh, funnily enough, I'm wearing a Packers T-shirt today. Oh, what? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I, I see. Uh, poor Aaron Rodgers. Speaking of the Packers, is probably going to struggle for for the rest of his life, isn't he? On that new contract, he's just signed. Oh, is he ever? Yeah. I, I don't know how he's going to live. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Must be nice. <laughs> poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. That's awesome, uh, Mark. It's funny because going through you know year by year of the ISCs, I noticed that. You got to play with the who's who of softball throughout your career. Is there is there someone that you never got to play with that you wish you you, you had the opportunity to? Um, I never thought about that. Um, because you did right. I I I, I did get to play with um the best of the best. Mm-hmm. You know, o- over over those years. Um. I'm sure. Um, let's keep talking, and I'm sure there'll be a name that pops up because. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you got to you, you got to catch you got to catch Zach, you got to catch Peaches, you got to catch Meredith, all those guys. I mean, yeah. Like, <laughs> is, is there 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 had to be a pitcher? I mean, you got Undy. I mean, Randy, is, is Randy there, Frame. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, funny Undy. That, that reminds me. I was thinking of that before when I I I brought his name up. But my first IC was um, Sioux City was in Saskatoon in 87 mm. and um, Undy was right in his prime then and we opened with Owen Sound on the number two diamond at um, in Saskatoon there and I remember we, we beat uh, Owen Sound uh, one nothing, and in the first innings Undy struck out four um, <laughs> and he uh, I think how it went was our lead off got on drop third strike um, got on uh, passable second, passable third. Um, I think I got the RBI being struck out on a third strike that was missed. <laughs> um, yeah, and that that was the only run that scored. But the very, I remember the very, you know, I obviously came in with a yeah, this young, young upstart from New Zealand with a bit of a reputation. And Andy, you know, he's got that hook on his, or he had that hook on his rise ball. And on that number two field, the, the lights weren't that great. Mm. Um, 
and he was throwing gas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he, he threw the first rise ball to me and it came up and, you know, up under my chin and knocked me down to the ground. And, you know, your ego takes over and you stand up, don't dust yourself off and you stare back out to the mound and then you see this massive left arm <laughs> looking at you, you know, and you just kind of nod and say, thank you, can I have another? <laughs> yeah. It was like, wow. Yeah. That was my introduction to uh, Brad Underwood. Uh, and cool. funnily enough, we, we ended up, you know, we ended up playing together. Um, <laughs> but, you know, great. Great, great man, and, and really enjoyed the battles that we had. But also, it was cool to be able to play together in the end. And the same, the same with Zach, you mm. know, with Darren that we'd battled for so long. And then, you know, last year and with County, um, we got to play alongside each other. And uh, and and did I, I? I think I managed to catch to him for one game, um, but it only, I think it only happened for one game because we were both too headstrong. And oh, yeah. I, I, want, I wanted to call one way and he wanted to pitch another. <laughs> oh, yeah. And whenever there's, whenever there's a conflict pitcher and catcher, I think the pitcher always wins <laughs> with, with, with yeah. the manager, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but no, uh, you know, phenomenal uh, pitcher, you know, really dominant through his days. And um, oh, I really loved facing him because I, I love facing those – the best guys, the guys I really struggled with was there was the guys that I, I didn't get excited to face. Right. You know, where, where those top guys always got excited to face, you know, you, and always look forward to it because it was a challenge. Yeah. And, you know, they were always up for the challenge. I was going to, I was going to ask if, if there was a, if there was a pitcher that you had a lot of trouble with, but I mean, it was probably those ones that, you know, not a lot of people would know about because you always rose to the occasion against the top notch pitching. Yeah, well, there are two guys uh, uh, in the States. Uh, one was uh, Ron Sturkel, who pitched for uh, Aurora. Um, and this is probably in my early days with Sioux City, so sort of late 80s. Um, and Ron was a was a was uh, an older guy that had been around for a while, and, and his I think it was his dad was um, the great Harvey Sturkel. Uh, that pitched for U.S. teams, and I, I think my dad played against him at, a, at an ISF. Oh wow! But he uh, he was a power pitcher, but Ron had the most amazing changeup, and you know I prided myself on being able to pick pitches and um, work out what was happening before it was pitched. But I couldn't get anything, and you know what? It, it didn't matter if I swung two or three times; I, I didn't hit it off him. I think <laughs> him and a guy uh, Pete Coolenkamp from. Illinois. Now Pete was about a hundred when he finished pitching against me. I think. <laughs> um, and he he used to hobble onto the diamond left hander, and he used to throw these little wrinkly pitches that I had no idea what was happening. Um, and I couldn't, you know, I'd swing, and I'd go back to the dugout and go, "I swear to God, I, I was right on that." You know? <laughs> um, I don't know how I missed it, but there was a there was a time where uh, he was playing for a P. Decatur picked him up when they came to Sioux City one time and they, they brought him in in a game where uh, situation, runners in scoring position, and I was hitting and they brought him, like baseball, brought him in in relief to throw just to me. And as he walked out, seriously, the guy had to be 60 when he was coming out. He stopped halfway out to the mound hobbling. He looked at me and he winked. <laughs> and I, and I, I just I just crumbled. You know, I, was like, I was broken and he you know, struck me out. And I think oh, the shit. first time I got a, a pop-up off him, I – I did. I jumped for joy running down first baseline. It's like <laughs> this is the first time I put I put wood on it. God I love him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. I love stories like that. Yeah, uh, Mark. Let's jump over to the Black Sox here. Uh, I mean, of course, you guys would win three in a row there from '96 to 2004. What was it about that team during that eight-year span that made you guys the best in the world? Oh, uh, I think it really came down to. You know, sort of. We obviously had a group of guys that were um, were really talented. Uh, we had a group of guys that were uh, really unselfish. You know, so prepared to play for each other. Mm. And you know, to pull it all together was that they were they were pretty passionate about playing for New Zealand. Mm. So you know, if you can if you can get that kind of connectivity um, with with a group with some talent. Um, you know, and you get that chemistry right that we talked about before, 
you you can achieve great things. And you know, obviously, we did through that time. Uh, we had a consistent core of guys. You know, ninety six, we were quite a young team, uh, and then you know got better in two thousand, and and then it culminated in two thousand and four, where I think you know it was when we were at the peak of our powers. Mm. You know that. That is, I've never been a part of a group that worked as hard as that team did um, because it was the first time it was going to be held here in New Zealand for since uh, 1976. Right. You know, and, and, and at that time, my dad played in that event. So, you know, it was a long time between drinks. Um, and just, to, uh, I guess, to give an example of the, you know, the, the focus and connectivity is that we, you know, uh, obviously our, our summer is, is October through March. So, yeah. you know, we, we're playing through Christmas and typically it will break over Christmas and, you know, there'll, there'll be a couple of weeks off while for the festivities and stuff and then you get started back into it in, in sort of early, mid-January. Um, but that particular year, you know, we're, we're all on training programs and stuff and, uh, and I remember the, the day after Christmas Day, Boxing Day, uh, you know, we'd all you know, celebrate and stuff, and it was, um, you know, I said to my wife that, that I'm going to go to the gym uh, and have a workout. So I went to the gym for a workout, and I walk in there, and there were five other of my team members that had thought the same thing so on awesome. the same day. That's so awesome. So wow. there were six of us there training, um, and it wasn't an organized session, you know. So I kind of walked in, and I saw everybody at different in different corners of the gym and, and just kind of nodded, you know, it's like, yeah, this is special. Yeah. You know, this is, this is the stuff that you can't script because it, it just has to be something that, you know, is driven by the individual. So, you know, little things like that, that, um, that contributed to the success, you know, so on boxing day, you've got six guys going when, you know, most others are going to be sitting back in the sun with a barbecue and a beer. Mm. Uh, it's not saying we didn't do that later in the day. Oh, but, absolutely. But <laughs> we, we took we took care of business early, which, you know, um, doesn't sound like a lot, but in, in a team perspective, when you're trying to get everybody rowing the boat in the same direction, it, um, it was really important, but very, very cool. Yeah, no doubt. I, I was going to ask, you know, about all those world title wins, it, like, they're all special, of course, if there was one that has a little bit more meaning. Was 2004 a little bit more special for you? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I've referred to that, you know, I guess since I've stopped playing a few times uh, because I think it it was it was also my best performance, you know, for, um, uh, offensively and defensively. Um, That's because of Tosh, uh, wasn't it? Because of Tosh, yes, it was. He gave me, he gave me a pouch of red man. Shit, don't tell, don't tell anyone that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. It was. I was hanging out for a for a chew. Uh, yeah, I think I think he gave it to me on the the last game of round robin, and after that, I think I went nine, nine for, for eleven. <laughs> that's yeah. a, that's unreal. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh funny. Nah. It. Uh, but I. It, yeah, you, know, you play your whole. Well, I played my whole career, and it was you wanted to, um, you know, to get the opportunity to play in front of, you know, your family, your friends, and in the softball public, um, was a real great opportunity, and that was something that we talked about a lot. Is that we, you know, we we didn't want to miss the opportunity to show the rest of New Zealand what a special group we had. You know, so it was never we, we we've never spent a huge amount of time focusing on. This may sound strange, but focusing on winning, you know, it's always been about quality performance and, and quality people. Um, and if you get that right, then the outcome will take care of itself. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and that's something that, that Don Tricker drove, you know, started with Mike Walsh coaching and then Don Tricker took it to another level um, within the group was, you know, it was, was about developing, you know, quality people. Yeah. And as so I talked about before, having un unselfish attitudes where, you know, it didn't matter whether you're hitting three, four, five. If you were called to bunt to sacrifice someone over, you didn't do a half ass job and kind of get the bat around and foul it off so you could swing at the next pitch. You, you actually got yourself around and put the ball down and, and you advanced that runner over. Right. Um, you know, just the simple things where, you know, uh, a lot of guys make the mistake of trying to, you know, trying to hit that three run home run with no one on base. Right. Um, yeah. When, 
you know, when to build pressure, um, you know, a six or seven pitch walk will do more for the team mm-hmm. than and, and momentum than hitting a home run. Yep. You know, the home run, that yeah, run scored, but the pressure's gone. There's no pressure on the pitcher. So, you know, with every runner on base, you can build that extra pressure. So, you know, it's just those little things that you can do um, and, and, and you can contribute to the team cause. And that's during that time, I think we, we got that recipe right, you know, that, that we had some really unselfish players that uh, were prepared to, you know, uh, walk over broken glass for each other. Right. Yeah, absolutely. How sweet was it to hit that home run in the finals against Canada? Yeah, well, it had, you know, as a kid growing up, you you dream of, you know, I did, I, I dreamed of hitting a home run in the final of a World Series. Yeah. You know, that was it. And and not that I, I'd thought about it prior to then, but it was my sixth ISF and it was, it was my last. Um, and I'd been in the final uh, every time. Uh, but had never managed to, uh, to you know, hit, hit, hit or a game-winning home run like that. So um, it, it was very, very cool. You know, I really uh, I look back and and cherish it. But to be honest, I think my at bat prior to that was possibly the most important, or one of the most important at bats that I'd had in my uh, international career. Was the one that tied in the three. No, it had. Um, we had, or um, well, the Canadians had scored two or three in the first innings. Three, uh, three. Yeah. yeah, I'm taking my memory there. <laughs> so they, yeah, come out of the block, scored really well, um, and we, Dion Nukunuku, had got a hit, get on base, got him around to third, and with two outs, I was hitting, and and I just got a, I guess a harmless single up the middle, which drove uh, bought. Dion home, uh, but what it did was it released the pressure. Yeah, right. So it it it, it allowed us to you know we our offense had been really strong and productive that whole week, and if you get shut down after the opposition jumps out to a lead like that's really hard to come back. So in the context of the game, that was really important. You know that um, just getting one run. You know, and when the guys had come in uh, in the dugout there, I'd said to the guys, "Hey, all we need to do is just get one run this inning." That's all we need to do. Mm-hmm. Let's just put one up on the board, work to get guys on base, move them around, get a run, and then we'll go from there. Um, and then, yeah, uh, next thing is like Patty, uh, Patty Shannon had a two-run home run to tie it, and then mine was after that, the next inning. That's right, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, to, oh, mind you, I had another at-bat like that against uh, Zach in, in 96 in the first of our – um, three world titles there. I, th- I think Darren had struck out nine in a row or something, um, or eight of nine, and he was uh, he was on fire. But again, I, I just got a harmless single to left field, and it just released the pressure. Yeah, you know the pressure was building. He was dominating. He was mowing guys down, and then all of a sudden, you, you know, a single guys guys start believing. Ah, he is hittable. Mm. Um, with the further you go, the more you go with strikeouts building and mounting. People are going shit. I don't want to. Can someone come yeah. in for a pinch at me? <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's funny so, what those yeah, little things can do, though. Oh, 100 percent. It is. Yeah, momentum. You know, um, the small small things can have a big impact on momentum in games. And mm. yeah, so I've, I've always been a believer that you know the it's the little stuff that creates the opportunity to win championships. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not the big stuff. Yep. Um, the big stuff will take care of itself um, if you get that little stuff right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Even Absolutely. like your uh, infield fly on that 100-year-old man that, that lifted yeah. you up. <laughs> yeah. Jumping up and down. There you go. <laughs> Pete Cooling Camp. Yeah. Pete Cooling Camp. Uh, Bless him. Yeah. Now, yeah. you mentioned Don Tricker. We had Don on the podcast here last month and, and such a great interview. I mean, Don... Oh yeah, such a great guy as well. Uh, was he a master manipulator when he put that 2004 team together? Because he mentioned little things that he he uh, mentioned to you know to you especially saying you know you never won one at home and you were retired, yeah, no. weren't you? Yeah, I was. Yeah, <laughs> he he was a little bit like that, um, but he, he there, <laughs> there was always sincerity in his eyes, you know. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, he certainly, 
um, knew how to pull the right strings yeah. and did uh, did a huge amount of work with that group. And it started before 2000, you know, when he, he took over in about 98, I think it was, yeah. um, about developing that unselfish attitude. But, you know, he, he created an environment where, you know, I don't ever recall him calling a hit and run or a squeeze. Um, I don't ever recall us, us stealing a huge amount of bases, um, but the environment was conducive to high performance and he basically was the conductor of the orchestra, <laughs> you know, and, and he let the guys go out there and, and do their thing. And um, it was a really valuable lesson there from – you know, from a leadership point of view, and, and I look at it now in terms of my coaching, is that, you know, don't overplay your hand. Um, you know, create the environment, you know, upskill the athletes, you know, provide the right platform, and then let them do their job. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and that's and that's what Don, uh, what Don did so well. You know, he's, um, and he'll tell you, he probably did, he's, he's a pretty unremarkable type of guy, but... Once you get to know him, he's extremely remarkable. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, he could, and what I mean by that, he could walk into the park and people wouldn't notice him, but then after they'd spoken to him, they'd look and go, mm. "Who the heck was that guy?" Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's like wow, um, and that's you know, I I, uh, I think I became a disciple of Don, you know, because yeah. of um, his his uncomplicated manner of dealing with things you know i remember i think it was my first time picking a team for a an isf in uh, 2015 which was back in saskatoon funnily enough um and i called don and you know he he was obviously long since retired and he was working for the all black scene and called him and said we need a coffee and he said okay what's the brief and i said i got a selection problem and he said okay so we were we were supposed to be meeting for a coffee uh, at a cafe down the road from his office, but he said, "Hey, got a lot of lot of stuff on. Come up to the office, you know. And New Zealand rugby for uh, the, over here for us is that's the pinnacle, you know. So walking into the offices of New Zealand rugby in Wellington was was pretty cool, you know. I'm like, wow. And then seeing Don uh, walk through and everybody sort of interact with him, knowing it was one of our guys, you know, that he cut his teeth playing softball, right. you know, sort of added to it. So he said, oh, the meeting rooms are uh, tied up. Let's uh, let's go in here. And we went into the office of the CEO, a guy by the name of Steve Chu. And then so I'm thinking, holy shit, we're in this, the office of the CEO and he's got one of these walls with the, that are painted with whiteboard paint and – a whole bunch of stuff written on this this whiteboard, and Don grabs. I just remember him grabbing the, you know, the whiteboard eraser and wiping it all off. And I'm like, Don, <laughs> what are you doing? He goes, just creating some space for us to write on. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, but all that stuff that's written on there. Oh, he goes, oh, he'll he'll have it written down somewhere. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh, okay, that's amazing. Um, yeah, and he 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 just said to me, he said, okay, what's the problem? I said, well, I've got three guys for two positions. Um, but I'm getting emotionally tied up, you know, here. I'm getting myself in knots. And he said, okay, what are the critical things that you want from your catches? And I we listed four or five things out. And he said, okay, I want you to rank each player one to three on those four or five, you know, criteria that you've put there. And I went, okay. So we went through. And about two minutes later, he circled a name and said, I don't see you've got a problem. Should we go and have that coffee now? Um <laughs> And I was sitting there looking, going, "What did he just do?" Wow! Um, but he, you know, a term that Don and he may have used it uh, when he was on is he declutters things. Yep, yep. And we complicate things with our mind, and it's the same when you're hitting. You know, you go to the plate. You, you, when you go into a bit of a funk, you, you overcomplicate things. So, mm. you know, when you know that when you're hitting well, you're not thinking about much. You're going out there, you're trusting yourself, and you're doing it. And in that situation was just me letting my mind get in the way of making a, a sound and reasonable decision. Um, you know, so he, he just helped me declutter and, and, you know, sort out that problem. And so that that's just, uh, you know, uh, people look at success in sport often as being rocket science, but it's actually not. Mm. Um, we, we make it a lot more complicated than what it needs to be. 
And a situation like that really highlighted it to me. But funny, after that, we we went into their um, their lunchroom, which is like a, a five star cafe. You know, uh, it would be like going into the best cafe in Wellington, and we're there, and they got these flash espresso machines and stuff. And Steve Chu, the CEO, walks in, and Don goes, "Hey, I don't know how to use this machine. Can you make Mark a coffee, please?" <laughs> and um, and I'm, I'm looking at Don going, what did you just say to him? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And, and Steve's like, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, so Steve makes it, he's making me a coffee, and I'm sitting there going, holy shit, I've got the CEO <laughs> of New Zealand Rugby making me a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, unreal. Uh, Wow. I'm just a humble boy that, that's easily pleased by good coffee. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess. Oh, that's amazing, Mark. That's great. So, I mean, now that we're on the, the coaching side of things, like what's been your the biggest learning curve for you since you jumped into the coaching ranks? You can't create success through your own actions. No. You know, so I used to be able to swing a bat and call the pitches for the pitcher. Um and control the game. Mm-hmm. And that was the biggest challenge I found in the beginning was standing on third base coaching and not being able to do the things that I could do before. Right. You know, so um, you know, the, the success of the team has to come through the work that you do developing the team. You know, the, the coaching, the mentoring, the framing, um, you know, the situational planning and stuff. So yeah, it was it was transferring my IP from a player to a coach, and yeah, that took some time. Um, and did I get it right all the time? Nope, nope. But you, I've always been one that's been pretty honest um, and honest with myself in, in reflection. You always do a lot of self analysis mm-hmm. um, in terms of what went well, what didn't go well, what could I do better, and. Yeah, through, you know, uh, it's like, like anything. The more time you have in the saddle, the more comfortable you get. Yeah. And, uh, oh, geez, I remember the first time coaching uh, out of third base there, I was like a cat on a hot tin roof, <laughs> you know, signals bouncing around and stuff. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, actually, I can't have the same level of activation I had when I was playing when you're coaching because then you get a guy striking out and you, you're screwing your face up or yeah. uh, pump, uh, fist pumping your hand going, ah, oh, damn it, you know. So athletes, you know, watch and the, the guys watched my reaction, you know, and right. and if they didn't perform and I reacted uh, not positively, it affected them. You know, they it, crea- it created a – um, uh, an environment of fear, you know. Sh- we don't want to, we don't want to upset Mark, right? Um, you know, so it, it created pressure. So, you know, and that comes about through you know you do debriefs and stuff, and and then someone, uh, a lot of uh, this type of development takes a lot of courage, because it takes courage for someone uh, within a group to say to me and, and you know, Mark Sorensen, this this demigod of softball apparently, um, that what he's doing is affecting the way that we're playing. So, you know, it, it, it meant that I had to adjust because what, what, what happens down here is that if I walk into a softball park on a Saturday and I say that we should run the opposite way around the bases because that's how I feel like it should be on the day, it, people will say, yes, sir, yes, Mark, yes, Mark, okay, we'll do that today, no problem. <laughs> You know, so you never get questioned. Right. Um, so the courage to have, you know, to be able to have that discussion, um, I, I understood the significance of that. Right. So it meant that, you know, I needed to change. Um, and those, again, it's those little things that you you take for granted, you know, and you, you hop there. So, yeah, now I'd like to think I'm, I'm a lot um, – a lot more calmer and mellow at, at third base <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> than than I was at the start. Yeah. Um, but it's you know it's it's life and it? it's about evolving and evolution's got to be a really important part of our game. Absolutely. How special was that uh, 2017 win up here in Canada? Oh, that that would probably be the second um, <clears throat> you know most uh, satisfying. World Cup win for me, mm. you know, mainly because yeah, there's, there's 
uh, you know, the Black Sox had built, you know, certainly a, a legacy and a reputation of success. And but it's it's not a guarantee. It's not a lay down mazir. So to be a part of um, you know a coaching group that took a group of young men that you know two years prior in Saskatoon we were sort of unheralded. We had a lot of new guys. You know we we had to bring. Uh, we sort of had a changing of the guard post the. 2013 event I mentioned earlier here at home. You know, we lost a lot of the, you know, the Jared Martins and the Thomas Marquez and uh, uh, the Reese Kaisleys. And, you know, the we didn't have many of those um, experienced guys left. So to, to climb back up that mountain with uh, a group that had a couple of years before been relatively unheralded, although we were 5 nothing up in the final against Canada. <laughs> yep. Um, I thought I'd bring that up before you guys did. Oh, we won't do that. We're not, we're not allowed to say Steve Mullally here. <laughs> yeah. No. Oh, God, I've had years of therapy to get over that. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> every time I, I walk by Steve, I look at him and just shake my head. Um, but yeah, to, it was pretty. Yeah, it was. It was pretty satisfying. Um, yeah. To special to, you know, you it's. Uh, I'm still still growing, I suppose, and evolving as a coach, and you know, to uh, and it doesn't always work. People that that had uh, great playing careers, um, you know, transferring over into the coaching side of it and having success. So to be able to, um, you know, achieve that, it really, you know, really sits very very highly in terms of my satisfaction scale. You know that because I know. As a player, you never fully appreciate what's involved in running a campaign. Mm. You know, you turn you turn up to an event and you play and you do that, but you don't realise how much goes on behind the scenes mm. um, and how much work. And you know, I quite often you know, tell people that, geez, in this role, eighty percent of my job is away from the diamond. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, and then what you see at, at a training camp or at a at an event is is just a small snippet of what we've actually done. Because so you you appreciate it. You know, um, quite a lot more than what you do. I think you did as a player. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. I mean, we, we talk about it here. Like us, me and Chris are we're coaching with the senior team here in, in East Hans, and hope you'd ha- agree with this. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's, 80, it's never eight percent yeah. is off the field stuff that yeah, we have to deal with. It's been on all, <laughs> yep. all winter, and we haven't even stepped on the field yet. Yeah, yeah, yep. No, I agree. But I love it, so yeah. I wouldn't change it for anything. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's, I, I, I'm uh, coaching my daughter's. Uh, uh, she's in an under-13 team and coached them for the last couple of years. And and after we had uh, – after we went to uh, Prague and, and we didn't do so well a couple of years ago um, – had a, a review with high, high performance sport. Now, high performance sport is, is like our fun, government funding agency that provides us the support to run our programs. And uh, I had, you know, had a three hour uh, debrief with them in front of a panel of five people. And, you know, they're throwing questions at your left, right, and center. And, um, and they asked me, you know, so what are you doing personally to ensure that um, you're going to be better next time, you know, in terms of personal development? And I said, I'm coaching – at the time, it was an under-11 team. And I said, I'm coaching the Parramatta Plimpton under-11 cheaters. <laughs> <laughs> and they kind of you know, they kind of look sideways and then they yeah. look at me and go, okay, uh, go a little bit further. And it's like, well, that's where it all started for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's that's where the ga- – uh, my dear, my daughter plays, but actually the kids come along to play the game for fun. Yeah. And, you know – I just want uh, each week I go out there and I try and make it fun for them. So it doesn't, you know, if we've got runners on first and second, uh, the opposition does, you know, I'm just telling the girls to throw it to first base. Just yeah. get in out. Don't worry about the force play. Let's learn about that later. So it's te- it's it's peeling things away. I'm really privileged. You know, I've been to the, I go to World Cups. I've been to the, you know, to the uh, Padre Spring Training. I get to go to all these things, but this is grounding me. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. this has taken me back to what, what why I started playing the game. Mm. So, you know, and that's really important. And they kind of nodded and went, "Okay, I get it. Thank you." Wow, 
It's a good way. So mic drop. Just honest, you know. <laughs> great, great perspective right there. Yeah, hundred percent. Sure. Jesus. So uh, I guess I mean we touched on it a little bit at the beginning there about uh, you guys hosting here in November. Obviously, looking forward to that. I mean, the home crowd again back for the WBSC World Cup. That's going to be uh, quite an event. Oh, I think it is, and I, but I think every every country is going to be you know, jumping out of their skin. Oh, that's looking right. Yeah, to plan the event. You know, we've we've all been on um, under such restrictions for so long now that you know coming back, and it's <laughs> it's funny that it's, it's you know we're playing a sport where it's three strikes and you're out because you know it was meant to be what well, February last year. Yeah. Um, then it was going to be February this year. It was postponed to, and now it's November. So it, it is a third strike. Yeah, really. Um, and it's the last chance mm. to have it. So, yeah, it, it just oh, I'm, I'm really relishing the opportunity to again put on display, you know, what what great athletes we have playing the sport. Because uh, in, in recent times, sort of last the last five years, there's there's been a bit of a growth around baseball here. So. You know, and, and and not that it's had a uh, a detrimental effect on on our sport, but people that um, people that don't know a great deal about the differences in both sports over here because they see baseball on TV all the time, think that that should be the you know should be the priority. But it's really an opportunity for us to showcase that yes. you know, we too have exceptional athletes, and and that's where. You know, all of the countries coming in sort of help help us do that and promote the game. That you know, we've actually, you know, we 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 got a fast paced game that you can get over within two hours, and yeah. you know, yeah. the guys, you know, yeah. the guys from one a standing start can can throw it at one hundred and thirty plus kilometers an hour. Yeah, um, you know, you still see the ball flying over the fence. You, you know, you still see great plays. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, any time we get an opportunity to um, showcase. Our sport, which you know, I'm obviously pretty passionate about here at home, um, I think is is uh, a great opportunity and special. Absolutely, and I think this one, you know, this one being the first one since Prague, I mean, it's coming becoming like a more of an even playing field, don't you find? I mean, you don't have it's just it's not you guys, Canada, and the Aussies anymore. Yeah. There's Argentina, no. there's Japan, like there's Venezuela, like there's. Uh, it's getting to be a level playing field. And the field. Czech guys are coming as well. Yes, that's right too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, uh, well, personally, I, uh, I think that Prague was probably the the most competitive um, ISF that I've seen for a long time. Mm. You know, and, and you're right. There was always, you know, the, the, the top teams were always great, yeah. you know, and always have been and always will be. But, geez, the, um, you know, the level of competition has increased um, immensely over, you know, I think over the last, and, and maybe it has something to do with the two yearly cycle, but the two yearly cycle was just so hard financially um, yeah, on countries yeah. to be able to send teams you know, every second year. So every year you're having two teams go to a World Cup. So mm-hmm. maybe that contributed to it, but then the WBC and their wisdom um, cut it from 16 to to 12 teams. Um which uh, yeah, I, I don't agree with. I'm, I'm disappointed in it because mm-hmm. there's going to be some good teams that miss out. Right. You know, there'll certainly be one or good, one or two good teams from the Americas that miss out. Um, the, there'll be a good team from Europe that misses out. Um, and well, Asia, but you'll you'll certainly see Japan, Japan come yeah. through there. Yeah, I for mean sure. that, that's a given. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. At um, twelve teams, I, 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 geez, I loved. It. I, I think I remember back in the day when there was twenty, yeah. you know, ten in each division, and you're playing more than one game a day. Yeah, you know, and that, those, geez, those days, uh, you you get through and you're playing fifteen, sixteen games in a World Cup. Um, at the end of it, it, it became a real endurance test. That's right, too. Yeah, yeah. it definitely would be. I I had to laugh when you said uh, with Chopper and Damien there that you wish you could have maybe had the Argentinians there last year because they'd be still celebrating from 2019. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every time, every time I, I got a communication, it's like, there's another bloody party going on in Argentina. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, Julio, you know, I, I, I wrote to Julio um, after Prague because I never got to see him. Right. 
um, and congratulated him because he'd, we played together in uh, in Marathon with county county materials and county concrete and stuff. So, yeah. you know, we uh, and with Lucas Mata and, and obviously the uh, Lucas's younger brother, Humio uh, or Mumu. Mm. Um, uh, you know, was the dominant pitcher for them there. So, you know, I wrote to him and congratulated him because I, you know, if, uh, uh, if we couldn't win it ourselves, it, you know, it's great to see someone that you've got a connection with and know mm-hmm. personally uh, getting some success because I know how hard he'd battled over the previous years, you know, trying to get um, that talented group of guys to come together. And, you know, the things we talked about before around chemistry, mm-hmm. um, you know, I know how hard he'd battled with that. So, you know, to see them succeed in that final with, with them in Japan, um, that, uh, that that was quite a special game. Absolutely. And, and huge for their country and program as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, Mark, we got a little something that we like to end the podcast with uh, called Player Association. I'm going to throw out uh, a couple names to you. And uh, if you have a story about them, feel free to <laughs> feel free to throw it out there. So, uh, first one here, we're going to, I'm going to throw it is uh, Jimmy Cotter. Oh, well, um, possibly the best player that I've ever seen. Um, you know, he was like, Jim was like an older brother to me. Um, and when I first, he played for my Cardinals team. Uh, he came over to, to our club from, um, uh, the wire wrapper just over the hill and and came over as a catcher so I, I made that initial connection because I was this was before I was 14 and playing alongside him yeah. um, but then he moved to center field you know and he he, he be, I think he became the best center field in the game hit run throw hit for power um, pretty much did it all and and I think the first real five tool player that that I can remember seeing so you know, he was one of the first position players to go and play in North America, and, and I think he, you know, we talked about that before. He was one of the guys that opened the, opened the door for guys like myself to get the opportunities. So, you know, I, um, very very special, uh, talented player, and you know, he was a junior All Black rugby player as well. Wow. So, uh, he, uh, he he was another one that we uh, we lost too young. Um, also, unfortunately, killed in a car accident. Well, that's yeah, definitely unfortunate for sure. Uh, next on the list is uh, Michael White. Um, probably the 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 best performance pitching performance I've ever seen. You know that uh, Whitey threw the he. You know I've seen and caught to a lot of pitches that that on, on days when things are going well, they will get you know they'll succeed and be dominant. And if it's against a team they believe they can beat, but Whitey would take the ball against anyone. Mm-hmm. And he would still fight on days when he didn't have his good stuff, you know. And, and I'm sure you guys remember he he, um, he blew his arm out in the '87 IC, I think it was That's that right I too. talked about before, yep. Yep. playing for Teleconnect, you know. So they basically had to rebuild his arm, you know, in terms of his bicep disconnected. So he had to reinvent himself as a pitcher and. You know, he's he was always tenacious, but from there, and he went from being a power pitcher to to a real craftsman. And you know that performance that he put on in the uh, in the final of the '96 World Series, um, where he threw a perfect game, you know, was quite outstanding. Yeah, you don't get you know, that. You don't get those too often, especially in the in the finals. <laughs> no, just a game of that significance, you know, and he was always going to pitch that game for us. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I, I, I do remember going to Mike uh, Mike Walsh, um, who funnily enough stopped into my work yesterday and had, had a coffee. Um, <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he's a softball, he's another softball tragic that we have over here with all of it, like all of us. <laughs> um, he, uh, I, I went to Mike and said, hey, uh, you, you better get someone else ready because Whitey's warm up is terrible. He's got nothing on the ball. <laughs> and, you know, the first innings he went out there and um, I can't remember the first three hitters, but Colin was hitting third and, and all three of them hit line drives. And then the second innings, um, they hit the ball firm. And then from about the third innings on, I don't think they got good wood to anything. Wow, uh, and he just he just grew and grew, you know. So started the game with a after a terrible warm up, not a lot happening, but 
he was a real fighter, you know, and he always had that he always had that location. Um, he always had that confidence in his ability that I talked about earlier. Um, and and he would never give up. You know, even even when you're behind, mm-hmm. um, he still found a way. So, you know, certainly um, one of the best, if not the best, pitcher that I ever caught to. Right on. Two more here. Uh, Canadian former teammate, uh, friend of the show, Colin Abbott. <laughs> Abbey. I kind of knew that he'd be coming Abbey. Yeah, <laughs> I heard he likes KFC. Oh, he does. Yeah, I was just going to. Oh, you've heard that story before. Yeah, on the way to the gym. Yeah, on the Can way to the gym. KFC. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean go to KFC? That's unreal. We. Uh, oh, he was part of that era that I talked about the uh, in Green Bay where you know because we're similar age and we're growing up together and we had a huge amount of fun. Um. You know, we worked together at the all car store, and uh, it, it was it was a fun time. You know, and um, he he was a great great player. You know, great great hitter. Uh, possibly, he will love this. Possibly the worst outfit I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what, he could hit uh, a rice ball though. Oh man, he could hit it all right. Um, and great sense of humour. So no, we, we uh, yeah, I, I, a lot of time for Abby, and um, you know, really love my time playing with him. Um, and we, but and funnily enough, you know, he's a real classy guy, and that that performance I talked about with Whitey, hmm. um, uh, Abby was the he was the last out in the seventh inning. So with two outs, um, you know, he comes up to the plate, and and I think it, uh, I can't remember the count, but. Uh, we had two strikes and the umpire put his hand between, you know, put his hand on my, on my back and just sort of uh, put his head down and said, hey, Mark, just want to say congratulations. You guys have been fantastic all week and, and thoroughly deserve this title. And uh, remembering we only had two strikes. <laughs> so um, I was thinking, okay, uh, this pitch isn't going to be very close, but it's going to be called a strike. So <laughs> I, yeah, I called a low rise outside and I swear to God, I was six or eight inches off the plate and, and the umpire rung it up oh, and shit. stuck him out, you know, perfect game. And then, and I talked to Colin later, and I'm like, oh, dude, sorry, that 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 pitch was way off the plate. And he goes, man, it didn't matter. We weren't going to hit hit uh, yeah. Whitey with a tennis racket today, yeah. you know. Wow. So it just speaks volumes of the man, you know, really classy. Yeah, um, sure. But it funny in uh, in uh, 2004, he he was the last out as well. Oh. Um. Oh, that's right. He was uh, too. <laughs> yeah, he uh, hit the ground ball to Dion at Dion, second. Yeah, and yeah, and I remember uh, with two strikes, he'd hit a foul ball down the right field line. Two strikes, I got up and kind of cleaned the plate because we used, we used to talk smack to each other, even when we're playing together. <laughs> and I and I remember getting up and cleaning the plate, and and then uh, turning to come back, and I looked at him. I said, uh, "Hey, who? You were the last out in '96 as well. Remember?" <laughs> And uh, <laughs> got a short, sharp response. <laughs> uh, yeah. Love that. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. No, no, great, great, great man. Yeah. Love stories like that. Uh, last, certainly not least, uh, you know him pretty well, Patty Shannon. Patty Shannon. Um, well, I've, I've got him on my coaching team now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? How's that and- going? <laughs> It's it's going great. Good. Yeah, Patty's Patty's doing a great job. Uh, you know he he was a real competitor. You know he still he still is. He came and came and stayed with me uh, we, we, a year ago when we had an event down here, and um, he took me through a workout because you know, he still still works out really hard, um, and and about blew me out to be honest. <laughs> but you know he's still in great nick. Um, he's passionate. He's a real competitor. I mean, I, I remember his first tour. We were Ryan Brand was playing in Grand Prairie, um, and we were playing. Uh, what was it? I can't remember the name of their team. Um, Grand Prairie, Grand Prairie Pride. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and the Ob Brothers were playing there. As well, uh, well Sean and Sean O'Brien. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I'm pretty sure Robbie was there. Certainly, Sean was catching. 
I thought both of them. Um, but uh, in the first game, I hit a couple of home runs off um, off uh, Ryan. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was our first game at, a, at you know we'd been training for about three months. You come out that first game, you, you know, I use the phrase "cat on a hot tin roof" before you're just bouncing, ready to get out there and play. And uh, yeah, I had a pretty good game. And then Paddy came to catch the next game. And and I looked at him and said, "There you go, son. See the standard you've got to live to." And he just looked at me, and then he went out and hit two home runs, the first two at bats, and he came back to the dugout and said, "Okay, what's next?" <laughs> um, <and it> was, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's the type of uh, you know unrelenting sort of confidence that that Paddy brought to the table. Yeah, um, you know he. Uh, I'll tell you, he always wears number one on his shirt because he's the most important guy in the world. Um, <laughs> and there's only one of them. <laughs> oh. Oh uh, but he, um, as I said, he's he's done a really uh, great job so far. He did a little bit more, um, I suppose, relevant and connected to the guys, having having played more recently. Yeah, right. Um, and you know, he's he's going through that stage of. Um, uh, understanding and finding his niche in the role, mm-hmm. um, but he, he, you know, he. You get, as you get older, you get a little bit more politically correct, and you know your delivery and stuff. Where Paddy's still a bit old school, which is great, mm-hmm. and you know he'll jump out there and and tell the guys straight um, if if they're you know if they're being a dickhead. Yep, he'll tell them. Where you know you, as you you've you've been through years of coaching and you talk about you might not be achieving your potential right here, and Paddy goes ah you're just being a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I like that. Actually. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no, he he, he uh, you know he's a he's a winner too. You know, and, and that's um, that's what I really love is that he he brings that winning attitude. Um, you know, and he thinks um, he thinks. Similarly, but differently to me, mm-hmm. so that you know, because you, you can't you can't cookie cut or clone everything. You know, you need different uh, ideas and different things thrown on the on the table mm-hmm. um, when you're in selection meetings. Because as I said before, about you know, if I say we've got to pick this guy, I, I want us all to be on the same page, right? Yeah, you know, and if and if uh, Patty and, and Daryl, our other selector. Um, if they feel differently, they've both played alongside me and know me enough that they don't feel threatened, you know, and they can challenge. And we do have some some good robust discussions there. But uh, and Paddy certainly, you know, he um, he comes well prepared. Um, he's thought about what he's doing um, and thought about who he wants. And yeah, he's he's really starting to add some value for us. That's, That's awesome. Fantastic. That's awesome. Listen, Mark, I got to thank you for coming on the podcast. This has been amazing being able to talk to you. I mean, not only are a big part of the game down in New Zealand, U S but across the world as well, even here in Canada, man, I like, I'm so happy. I had the pleasure hoping I had the pleasure to talk to you. Oh, no, it's been great. Thanks a lot for having me on guys. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I love uh, reminiscing um, about the good old days because <laughs> it's not something you want to do too often when you're in a coaching Back yeah, in my right. day. Back in your uh, day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You don't want to be yeah. that guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, listen, uh, best Very of luck. Cool. Uh, best of luck. You know, hopefully you guys get on the field sooner rather than later. And uh, can't wait to uh, to be watching you guys in November. Great stuff. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Take All right. care. Take care, Mark. All right. See you, pal. Man. What a great episode. Yeah, that was... Uh... That was entering Peach's territory. Nah, not even close. No, we've done another hour and a half. No. Nah. No, fantastic. God. I, I so love much. being able to talk. Like, not 16 year old. <laughs> like, like, think what about it. We're talking, to, we talked to a guy that played in the IF, I, he won an ISF at 16 years of age. Yeah. Now he's the head coach of the New Zealand Black Sox. Yeah. Guiding these guys, hopefully, to a, to a world title. I mean, he did in 2017. Yeah. Like he's done it all. I have a question. Do you think there's any other 16 year old notable 16 year olds that have played at the IC level? Cole Evans. Except for Cole Evans. <laughs> Shit. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Wow. Cole that's a lot. Yeah. Actually Cole's pretty much following the footsteps of American. Yeah. Played as 16. Now he's the captain at, uh, 
yeah. at the same age Mark was. That's crazy. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, so I mean, uh, it can be done. New Zealand has a, you know, they have a great leader on their hands right now, not only in coach staff, but uh, their captain as well. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that, that was special. awesome. Yeah, that was Man, fantastic. Uh, uh, so happy we got to talk to Mark. Mark, yep. thanks again for coming on. I mean, it it really was a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, going forward, hope you, we have, uh, let's touch on Tide Fest. Yeah, go ahead. We have Tide Fest tournament coming up 15th July. 15th of July. July 15th, 17th. Yeah. We have a few teams entered right now. I mean, uh, hey, listen, if you want to come down, it's going to be a great time. Uh, prize money worth twenty five hundred dollars. I mean, that's nothing to to sneeze at. And Not to mention you get Tide Fest, uh, you get Tide Fest passes Fest. and activities, and yeah, it's a time. Like it, it really is. Randy, I mean, you seem very angry now. And stop the, yelling. I'm like, oh, I wanted to talk about something too during the podcast. When oh. you, you, what was you? What was your takeaway? Take. Did you take it away? But I know. Can you tell me, did you take it away? Take it away, take it away. <laughs> and then you wrote edit. Do I'm gonna, not edit that. I'm going to edit it. You can't. Why? Hey, Mark, can you tell me about the takeaway? <laughs> Could you take it and take it away? <laughs> All right, <laughs> what no. the fuck? Fine, I won't edit it. <laughs> I'll leave that in there. Anyway, so yeah, any any teams uh, back to Tide Fest, if you want to enter, the emails are on the, uh, the poster that we put on social media. Yeah. Uh, of course, we're going to, well, I'm going to start releasing it every week. Like we got to get it out there. Come on out. I mean, it's going to be a time. Well, I mean, the thing we, is we're trying to make this into something that's going to be annual event, an annual event. And we want more teams to come each year type thing. Mm-hmm. But anyway, let's not beat that dead horse too much. That's right. Anyway, Randy, it was fun for, to get back to, yeah. to this finally after a two week layoff. And yeah. uh, anyway, and we had a fantastic guest. Yeah. And uh, we have a special couple of guests coming up. Not too far away. Oh, <sighs> We're not going to mention. We're not going to mention it right now. Our, let's just say our hundredth episode is going to be awesome. That's all. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. Anyway, till next week. Cheers. Classified. Pick it up, pick it up, yeah. Pick it up, pick it up. Ha. Pick it up, pick it up. Nah, we ain't slowing down. Pick, pick it up, pick it up, yeah. Let's play a game, call the monkey in the middle. Married to the game, but I ain't scared to make a single. This right here got you feeling like a nympho. About the climax, with your face all in a pillow. It's a grand slam home run. Early morning tee off, sick of the hole of one. One, one, one. The underdog, but I'm winning it. Club closed, but the ticket DJ keeps spinning it. Oh, I can't stop this feeling that I come across. We're walking on water like the sun of God. Then I'm ghost, but this who you gonna call? Feels like Christmas when I'm sipping on that rum and all. It's that bonus on your paycheck. It's when the wifey surprised you with day sex. Yes, it's going on that first date. It's taking her over dinner and she offers to pay. That's a grand slam. Move the old feel way back. I'm swinging for the fence. That's a grand slam. I got a couple of drinks. Got weed and some money to yeah, spend. That's a grand slam. I'm feeling brand new. Like, no, I can't lose. That's a damn good day. Great advice, you in a dark place, this could be your way of life It's a feeling that could make you nice I'm trying to take these people higher, it don't matter if you're afraid of heights right, right, right. It's like that back massage, it's a bachelor party over your last hurrah Feels good, don't it? Good, don't Enjoy it while you can, cause this all stops when the record ends The street types of people I know that tell the truth Kids, drunks, and those who not in the lose I'm on my last drink though, but got no weed to smoke Oh, just found a joint in the seat of my coach That's a grand slam Sizing? Maybe need more room because of additions to the family, or possibly seeking that dream home you've always wanted. Well, Tim Eisner at Royal LePage Atlantic is the guy for you. With a proven track record and multiple awards, 
Tim goes above and beyond to find out your needs and exactly what you're looking for. So if you're seeking a new home or trying to sell your current one, contact Tim at 902-499-5717 or check him out on Facebook at Tim Eisner. Again, that's 902-499-5717. Trust me, when all is said and done, we'll be saying Tim Eisner strikes again.